Okay, Acts chapter 4. Here we go. Sundown tonight. God only knows what you're going to have for lunch today. Acts chapter 4. Here's the summation. The church is just beginning, okay? Pentecost has just taken place. The church is just now in its infancy, a little embryo, just, just being birthed, and it's going to go out. And a man was healed radically by some of the apostles. And the apostles were teaching the people about the resurrection of Christ. Now, the chief scribes and the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, overheard them teaching about the resurrection of Christ. This caused them some issues. So much so, they placed these apostles in jail overnight for preaching about the resurrection and using the name of Jesus, okay? There's already opposition to this infant church. But yet, many believed. Many believed in the teaching at that time, which really caused the Pharisees, the, the teachers of the law, to get a little bit wigged out about it. So they put him in prison for the night. The chief priest and the elders said, you no longer are you to preach or teach in the name of Jesus. Notice that. They didn't say, no longer are you to teach and preach about a resurrection. No, no. They said, in the name of Jesus. Now, this had something significant to it, the name of Jesus. So in their defense, they said, what, what are you upset with us for? We're simply displaying an act of kindness to a man who needs healing, and there he is. He's healed, and we're simply teaching Scripture. Nonetheless, they said, you will not use the name of Christ. Okay, there's two verses I want to focus on this morning as we internalize this into our hearts and minds for a season of fasting. Acts 4, 23 and 24. The apostles had returned back to the other believers, having got out of jail and having been chastised by the chief priests and elders. On their release, verse 23, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Okay, so you say, anytime you read a scripture like that, you ought to say, so what? Well, let's find out, so what? What does that mean? What's the significance of that verse? When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Okay, I want to introduce to something to you that is a dynamic that I think is very important, that many of you are not accustomed to, so please pay attention because... It's not something that's supposed to be done all the time, but nonetheless, it's not something that's supposed to be extinct from the church either. It is in Scripture. Now, if you're taking notes, put this reference down. Romans 10 and 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What, what that verse, the implication there is, not only when you read the Bible, but I would encourage you to speak the word out loud so you can hear yourself read the Bible. There's a dynamic to the way that we're made and the way we understand things. Some of us learn different ways, hear different ways, perceive things different ways. Speak the word of God, okay? Speak the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's good to read it and speak it. Now, when it comes to prayer, the typical MO is this. If I was to ask you all to get into a small group, as we've done here in our services as of late, and pray together in the group, what would happen is somebody would be praying and the other four people would be listening. Okay, well, we live in a multitasking world. So what we're saying there is we've got five people here praying, but God can only listen to one of them, and the other four need to listen to the guy who's praying or the girl. Now, these people did something quite different, and they were Jewish, so they had to jump on us. They're kind of out there anyway. They're kind of celebratory. They're kind of like over the top. They all prayed together. They raised their voice together. There's some kind of dynamic to that. I don't know what it is. Have you ever been in a service where people all pray out loud together? to the Lord at the same time. There's a dynamic to that. That's what these people did. Their reaction to the chastisement of the chief priests and the elders was to all raise their voice together. I want us to practice that at the end of this service. They directed their prayer to the Lord, not listen to one another's prayers. There's some power. I don't know what it is. And again, it's a mystery. There's some power to corporate prayer. There's some power to it. We have a son who's alive today because of the power of corporate prayer. I can't understand it. I can't explain it to you. I just know it to be true. There's some dynamic to raising your voices in prayer all together in unison. Second thing they do is they were together in prayer to God. We're going to start incorporating more togetherness in our prayer. And we're doing that before the service. Next Sunday at 1015, be in that balcony. Usher in the presence of God for a service. Prepare people's hearts who have yet to pull into the parking lot to receive what we have to say today. 
or next Sunday. That's together. They were together and they raised their voices. There was a unity to it. And where there's unity, there's anointing, by the way. Psalm 133 and 1. So they raised their voices and they were together in prayer. Now, you and I live in a world where we have to fight this, okay? I was thinking about this the other day. I'm sitting somewhere and I'm watching people interact with one another. Our culture will start to affect us and we'll conform to our culture if we don't watch this. There's a lot of individualism in our culture. And there's a lot of units or divisiveness in our culture. In fact, as time goes on and I get older, the more I see more prevalence in this area. More conservatives, more liberals. Greatest divide. There's more d Democrats versus Republicans. A lot less bipartisanship. That's politics. Uh, there's homophobes and those who are, are interested in, in, in free lifestyle. There, there's like di these dynamics of camps everywhere. And, and unfortunately, there's a moral diversity, okay? Now, what happens in our country, if you notice this, how many people remember after 9-11? What happened? We came together, didn't we? Some tragic event happened that what? Coalesced us together. We became one. Even the people of New York, man, they, I, uh, you could see it on television in the news reports. New York became one. One. Pearl Harbor, what did that do? Well, so I hear it made us one. Of one mind and one heart. The church has to practice that oneness because in the world we don't see it as much. We have got to be one as we fast. When you fast over the next seven days, your Daniel fast and then your distraction fast, Know that you're fasting with the rest of the church. That's important to participate. There's a spiritual dynamic to raising your voices together in prayer and being together on the same page. You're in most trouble in the church today when you're picked off from everyone else and all alone. Once that happens, you begin a downward spiral to be picked off and alone, okay? We have to be together in this fast. All right, verse 31, here's our key verse for the morning. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. That isn't that bizarre? Say that again. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Notice the relationship between prayer, the power of the Holy Spirit, and boldness. In the absence of prayer, you'll have the absence of the Spirit, the prevalence of the flesh in ministry. In the absence of prayer, you'll have a less of the Holy Spirit working through the church. And, in fact, you'll have a lack of boldness. When the church begins to shrink in on itself and hide itself from the world and cloister itself away from everyone who needs her, there's a prayerlessness. When we pray, when we pray together, when we raise our voices together in prayer, the Spirit leads the church, ministers through the people, and there's with a great boldness. The absence of boldness is the absence of prayer. The presence of the moving of the Holy Spirit in a church is the prevalence of prayer raised together in voices. You see that? It's very important. Any church you visit, you go on vacation, you go to another town, you go any church you go into, you sit there for 20 minutes and you can figure it out. If there's no boldness, there's no passion. People are in the flesh, be it an emotional extreme or dead church. There's an absence of prayer. We're not that church. We're a church that thrives on the lifeblood of the church being prayer. We're a church that sets aside seasons, as Ecclesiastes 3 talks about, seasons of prayer, seasons of fasting, seasons of self-denial, seasons of clarity, of confession, taking a young teenager and teaching them early on that you can make decisions that separate you from this world, choices, volition, that separate you from being told what you have to do and don't have to do. It's called maturity. And that's what we're learning here in this fast. After they prayed, the place where they meeting was shaken. Shaken, it's a Greek word. It means to agitate or shake, you know, to cause to totter. I like that word, totter to disturb, to reorient. The place where they prayed together, they lifted their voices, they prayed together, and the, after they prayed, the place was shaken, it was tottered, it was agitated, it was reoriented. The people were reoriented to see things differently. They had just been chastised, they had just been threatened, they had just been imprisoned, they had just prayed, and now they're bold. Now they got clarity. That's the way that works. Shaken, 
Now, this word shaken is peppered throughout the New Testament. Let me give you some examples of the word shaken. Because I think what God is wanting to do in this church, through willing servants, who will set aside things and fast and pray and seek his face, and turn from their wicked ways, this is what will happen. The first definition of the word shaken is a means of measurement. And you see this word shaken used in Luke 6 and 38. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Will be poured into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Uh, Imagine an ephah, or a bushel of wheat, or something in it. And And I hand that to you, and I said, here, I'm giving this to you as a gift. I meant to give you a bushel, and I'm giving you a bushel of wheat. And then you take the bushel, and you do one of these numbers with it. Start shaking. Now, the level of the wheat starts to drop because there was room in there. There was air in there, right? So you're shaking it. And you said, I thought you were giving me a bushel. Well, I didn't give you a bushel. No, no, no. You gave me three quarters of a bushel. What do you mean I gave you three quarters of a bushel? Well, I just shook it. I shook it, and now there's more room. I need more wheat. You ever go to a, get a bowl of soup and you realize you get to the bottom of the bowl of soup, there's an arch in the bottom, you really got a half bowl of soup. You ever go to get a Coke, you order a Coke, not this week, but last next three weeks from now, you order a Coke, what happened? It's all ice. Finally, you go, I just want a Coke in the ice. Well, we don't do that. Why? Because we were greedy. We want to make millions of dollars. Measure. Okay, so, so they want to, he says, shaken. The place where they were praying was shaken. What's, it, what's he saying? I, I want what you just did. I want what you just did not to be enough. I want to measure what you just did. I want to shake it so you see that there's room for more. Community Bible Church, there's always room for more. Shaken, press down and shaken. You get more for your buck that way. So the first thing you see about this little passage, I believe, is that God wants to shake this church. What do you mean? Well, we're content with where we are on some level. God wants to shake it. He says, nobody, you think you're there, but you're not really. You're down here. Look, I shook you. That's what a fast will do. The absence of fasting will cause you to live a life thinking you're actually where you're not. You're further down the bushel, and so am I, than we actually are. Fasting does that for you. Fasting reveals your love for cupcakes, your romance with intamin donuts. Fasting reveals... Gluttony. No one ever wants to preach on gluttony. Man, what a great way to empty a sanctuary. Preach on gluttony. (laughs) Shaken. You see it? All right. God, shake this church, please. Shake me, Father, when it comes to prayer. I think I'm I'm okay where I need to be in prayer. Oh, let me shake you. Oh, hey, I got some room to grow, don't I? Great. That's what a good thing is right there. That's good. The other, the other word for shaking in the New Testament comes in Acts chapter 1-8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It is a, it's kind of like a, an earthquake shaking. There is an um, epicenter. You know, you see a... The tsunami, they say, well, the epicenter was out in the ocean 500 miles. Or there was a a 7.1 on the Richter scale uh, in San Francisco. The epicenter was in some town outside San Francisco in the mountains. The epicenter is the, the, the exact point where the reverberation begins. And that point, that epicenter for these mountains is this church. This right here, that's the epicenter. This sanctuary, that balcony, the epicenter. Put that on your GPS Google map. Epicenter of the spiritual implications of prayer begin right here in this sanctuary. And they reverberate out. And that's what happened for the church. The epicenter was Pentecost, was that house that was shaken. And what happened? It reverberated out from that house. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. We actually are the fruit of that epicenter of prayer at Pentecost. Whoa, that's true. There's a shaking, a measurement, and an epicenter going on when we pray as a church. The second thing, or third thing, is that shaking is preparation. This word shaking appears in Matthew 11 and 7. As John's disciples were leaving, 
Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. Where did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? This John the Baptist, who Jesus called the greatest dude that ever lived, was a reed being shaken. He ended up losing his head, didn't he? He lost his life in a ministry of preparation. He's a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Well, that preparer, that preparation, John the Baptist, was a, a reed shaken in the wind. What does that mean? It means that when God shakes a church, he prepares a church. See, you and I don't know what lies ahead this year in our own little lives. Some of us may not even live here next year. Some of us might not even be alive this year. Some of us may have a challenge we didn't expect this year. Well, the reverberation and the preparation take place right here in this fast. What challenge you face in November was dealt with in January. You see that? Shaken. John the Baptist was shaken like a reed in the wind as a means of preparation. God wants to shake this church. Shake it up. Let's shake it up. Don't get content where you are. Shake it up. Let's measure it. Let's reorient. Let's totter it a bit. Let's get it off its track. Let's get the preacher off his own uh, ability. Let's get him desperate for the Holy Spirit. Let's get him craving and appetizing for the Holy Spirit and not relying upon, you know, some gift that he somehow has refined. Let's, let's move forward. Let's reorient. Let's totter. Let's, let's mix things up. Let's shake it. Let's prepare this church. Next thing you see is shaking as resiliency. You see this in Acts 4 and 31, our very verse. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. As they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. You know, when we did that series on the last days, a lot of people, they get freaked out about the last days, you know. It's like you're late for church because you couldn't get out of your bunker fast enough. We're all scared. We're all, not all of us, but some of us, we get all wigged out about that. Listen, prayer, shaking, brings forth resiliency. This world is not doing so good. And this world is turning on the church, this culture is. If we're freaked out about that, it means we haven't prayed enough because the praying shakes us. These people weren't freaked out about the, being imprisoned. They weren't messed up and over the top anxious about the chief priest and the elders. That didn't sway them one bit. Why? Because they prayed together. You know, prayer for them gave them a resiliency and an absence of fear against what these people could do to them. And many of them would die as a result. So, in other words, prayer insulated them from the fear of death, as I've told you before. Don't threaten me with eternal life. Don't threaten me with heaven. These people prayed, therefore they didn't freak out. They had a resiliency to the opposition. The next thing you see about this word shaking is the word reorientation. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and all at once the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. This is that beautiful story of the birth of the church in Philippi where Paul and Silas are praising God in the middle of the night in a, in a jail cell, and an earthquake comes and shakes the very foundation of that prison. They get out and lead the jailer to Christ, Acts 16 and 31. In Acts 16 and 31, they go to his house and they say, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you would be saved, you and your household. Now, prayer is about reorienting ourselves. If you come into January saying, okay, I ate an incredible record 75 bonbons over the holidays, and you, you came into church like this, oh, I'm ready for the fast. Great. It's good. We're glad you're here. I'm with you, by the way. Now, <clears throat> we have to reorientate the way we look. That's not even a word. I just made it up. Reorientate. We have to reorient ourselves towards what's going on. That's what prayer does. See, these guys thought they were in prison, and they could have just sat there and complained about it. What did they do? They praised God. The shaking reveals our perspective. Many of you are in bondage to this thing or that thing or this dilemma or that dilemma or some circumstance or lack thereof. Prayer will reorient the way you look at that. Prayer will take you and say, why, are you, why am I looking at it this way? 
I'm not really in jail, I'm liberated. I'm not really in bondage, I'm gonna praise God. Prayer changes the way we see circumstances. That's the shaking that goes on associated with prayer. And shaking is necessary for a harvest. Nahum, which I know many of you have read Nahum today, chapter three, verse 12, says this, all your fortresses are like fig trees with their first ripe fruit. When they are shaken, the figs fall into the mouth of the eater. You wanna get apples off a tree, you wanna get a pear off a tree, you wanna get a plum off a tree, what do you gotta do? You gotta shake the tree, shake the limb. Prayer is a shaking going on. They, the place where they were praying was shaken. What happened? They became more resilient. They saw things differently. They became bold in their witness. They didn't have issues that they saw they had issues with. They were prepared to do something and build the church, and the limbs were shaken, and the fruit came off. You want to bear fruit as a church? Start shaking the tree. Let God shake the tree, and let the fruit come off the limbs. You want fruit in your business? Get the praying. You want more deals? You want more commissions? Let God shake you. Let him remeasure what it is you're doing. Seed that and bathe that in prayer. So don't approach this thing like I'm gonna eat fruit for the next week. Approach this thing, I'm gonna bear fruit for the next week, for the next year, why? Because I'm shaking, I'm reoriented, I'm getting something tottered in my life. I'm asking God to shake me up, shake up my family, shake up my marriage, shake, 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 shake. That's what we gotta do together as we raise our voices in prayer. Will you be shaken over the next 21 days? That's the question. Will you be shaken during your personal times of prayer? If you're doing the Bible reading plan as I am, you're doing it along with me, yesterday Isaac and Rachel just got married. You're in Genesis 27, 28, 29. If you're not there, catch up. Get shaken. Reorient yourself. The greatest things in life are accomplished in the smallest increments. You want to read the entire Bible this year? Well, you've got to read about three chapters a day. It's effortless. It's nothing. You want to have a church that impacts the globe, the community, your brother-in-law, your neighbor, you get to praying. Let God shake it up. Let God do all of that. Question, will you be shaken in the next 21 days? Are you willing to accept some instruction on self-control? Are you willing to read that book, not because of any other reason that you want to see maybe what the Lord has to say to you through that book? Why don't we shake things up a little bit? I like the word quicken. God, quicken me. God, wake me up. Wake me up from my slumber. Help me see things I couldn't see before. Help prepare me. Help me give me some resiliency, some boldness, some passion, some desperation for God. Let some fruit fall from this tree we call the church. Is this your church? Is this your church? You need to answer that question in your own heart. Is this your church? and this is your church, then get busy. If this is your church, you take ownership and you, you get involved in that prayer. And know that when you do it, everyone else is with you. We're together on this thing. We're together like the world is never together. We're together. We're doing something. If we do all these nice things and have all these nice productions and have a sweet time together and make a lot of friends and have some incredible dinners and, and enjoy Fourth of July and have this and that, go to this country and that country, but we fail to pray and bear fruit, we failed our mission. Shake. If this is your church, demonstrate it. Because this is our time. This is our time to prepare for the year ahead. What are you gonna do? You gonna linger? You gonna dive in? Are you gonna grow? You gonna avoid conversations that have anything to do with the fast for the next 21 days because you're not involved. 21 days to form a habit, so they say. 21 days starts at sundown tonight. 
It hurts me to say this, but I should. Follow my lead as I seek to follow Christ. Let me be a pastor for 21 days. Let me lead you. In a world where there's very little authority, let me be that for you. When I fast and I pray, I gotta know that you're fasting and praying. A leader with no one following them is just a guy out for a walk. I don't wanna go for a walk. I wanna know in August that what we did in January made a difference. I wanna know what we're dealing with in July we were prepared for in January. I wanna know that that person who stands up in the Easter service and receives Christ was birthed like a child in labor right here in January. I wanna know in a Christmas Eve service this year, whatever we see fruit falling from the tree was because someone sat in that balcony next Sunday at 10.30, 10.15, 10.35. That's what I'm talking about. It's spiritual, can't explain it, but I can see it. Let's do this together.